began to rely on the presence of these things to turn on the police force, if you like, of the immune system. Without microbes, like M. Vaki, the immune system becomes overactive and causes constant inflammation. We spent all this time thinking about our immune system as this machine that repelled microbes, that just zapped them left and right, like one of those fly zappers. And it turns out that the immune system that we thought had evolved to kill microbes is actually controlled by microbes. Our modern lives, however, are isolating us from the very thing we need to stay healthy. Now, of course, we don't consume these bacteria because we have sterilized water and sterilized food. And it's thought that the lack of these bacteria is contributing to an increase in disease, specifically diseases that are related to inflammation. The evidence now strongly suggests that the rise in these diseases is a result of our isolation from the microbes we've evolved with. Soon, we may be able to treat immune disorders by putting the bugs back into our bodies. But the potential of bacterial treatments goes even further. Australian scientists are now injecting bacteria into mosquitoes to prevent us from getting sick. Mozzies are annoying at the best of times. They've developed elaborate weapons to get the food they need to survive, our blood. Mosquitoes need blood for protein to make eggs. Only the female mosquito feeds on blood. And without it, she really won't uh, uh, develop enough eggs to lie. But these syringes don't only draw blood. They often inject us with potentially lethal parasites causing serious infections, like dengue fever. Dengue is actually caused by four quite different viruses, and, uh, and uh, each of them has quite a different uh, effect in the host. So you literally have to have four, four vaccines uh, rolled into one. But scientists at Monash University have discovered an elegant way to combat the disease. Instead of vaccinating humans, they are vaccinating the mosquitoes. These mosquito eggs are being injected with a powerful bacteria called Wolbachia. Professor Scott O'Neill has spent much of his career studying this intriguing bacteria. I got introduced to it at a very early age. That hooked me and I've been studying it my whole life. And so one of the most amazing things about Wolbachia is just how common it is. If you were to look in a, in a bushland environment like this, and look at the insects within it, around 70% of those insects would all carry Wolbachia naturally. And when you think on the planet that there are two to five million different species of insect, that's a huge number that naturally carry Wolbachia. Just as gut bacteria can be good for us, Wolbachia is beneficial to insects, protecting them against invading parasites. By having Wolbachia within the body of the insect, it's acting like a probiotic for the insect, if you like. It, it's making the insect healthier and makes it able to fend off some of these other pathogens like dengue viruses. But there's a catch. Mozzies that spread diseases like dengue don't have Wolbachia. So the challenge was to find a way to infect them. In fact, you know, we spent you know, years and years trying to do that experiment. I uh, had many poor students who failed uh, in that uh, endeavour until finally we were able to succeed about four years ago. These mosquitoes host Wolbachia. They are so precious that volunteers will gladly sacrifice their ankles to feed them. We're rearing... Uh, thousands, occasionally uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of mosquitoes, and releasing them, not killing them. There have been outbreaks of dengue in Australia's tropical north in recent years. So to test their theory, researchers have been releasing the vaccinated mosquitoes in cans. Once released, Wolbachia spreads quickly. Every week they monitor how many of the wild mosquitoes now have the bacteria. And the results are paying off. The releases that we did in 2011 are close to 100% infected with Wolbachia. 
Wherever the mosquitoes have been released, the dengue has been stopped in its tracks. Following the success in Cairns, new trials have begun all over the world. But even super bacteria, like Wolbachia, have enemies. Like all living things, it's prey for the ultimate parasite, viruses. They are all around us, in the air, in the soil, in the oceans, and right now, three trillion are inside you. Most of them are probably doing us no harm at all, but a few of them are deadly, cause deadly diseases. From flu to AIDS to smallpox, viruses have killed untold millions of people. But some viruses, the retroviruses, have an even more extraordinary power. They have found a way into the very core of us, our DNA. On occasion, the virus will infect cells of what we call the germline. Those are the cells that are destined to become eggs in females and sperm in males. And if they infect those cells and get into the chromosomes, then these retroviruses get a free ride to the next generation. Robin Weiss was the first to prove that viruses not only cause disease, they can become genes. It was a eureka moment to realise that something that we think of as an infectious agent, as a virus going from one person to another, can be part of the normal inheritance. This was a mind-blowing discovery. By transforming into genes, retroviruses can replicate for millions of years. They are the ultimate survivors. Their reason for living is to replicate themselves. So if you can embed yourself into another host that's going to replicate uh, your genome for you, you've probably reached nirvana. These viral invasions of DNA are rare events, occurring perhaps once in a million years. Yet amazingly, one is unfolding right now in front of our eyes. Veterinarian John Hanger noticed that something unusual was killing the Australian icon, the koala. It seemed almost inevitable if they rang me up and said, oh, we've got a sick koala, uh, nine times out of 10, it was a koala that was sick with leukemia or lymphoma. It, it was so common. When he investigated, Hanger discovered a retrovirus in the cancerous tissues. Every single koala that we looked at and every single tissue that we, uh, that we isolated some DNA from and tested, they were all positive for the retrovirus. It's the first time we see it. On the other hand, it's an example of what we know has been happening during evolution in any case. We are the survivors of viral invasions like the one that is waging war on koalas. Human DNA is littered with the fossil remains of these ancient battles. It's amazing really, about 8% of our DNA sequences uh, in our human DNA is derived from retroviruses we are chock-a-block with fossil retroviruses. Until recently, these genes were considered insignificant, nothing more than junk. But we now understand that these genetic fossils have actually played a key role in evolution. In fact, without them, we couldn't be born. The same trick a virus uses to infect cells now allows a mother and fetus to fuse together through the placenta. This makes a very good, efficient barrier between the mother and the fetus uh, that is uh, protective, uh, but allows nutrients and oxygen to get across. Thanks to a protein that was once, millions of years ago, uh, a protein used by the virus uh, to infect cells. We shouldn't think of them as a scary part of our, uh, our machinery. They're, they're an absolutely essential component of uh, what we are. <laughs>